All right. So um, this is an uh, this is a topic that uh, uh, I've been giving it to our fellows and to fellows in other places on several occasions. Usually, uh, it's very interactive and attracts interest because during our fellowship teaching, we don't attend. We don't give a lot of time to um, electrogram interpretation in the devices. I think there is a little bit of a gap in the education. I am very fond of the topic and uh, happy to answer any questions as we go along. So, um, okay, now. All right. So, um, I tried to subdivide it into several groups of um, questions that you can answer when we're interpreting electrograms. So, one of the key things is the uh, differentiation between SVT and VT. And we have investigated this in the past. Let me minimize that. Um, we actually did a study on how well fellows do interpreting, uh, differentiating between SVT and VT. This is a paper, paper was published a couple of years ago in the Heart Written Journal. So this is from this paper. What criteria do we use to differentiate? So if you have a single chamber electrogram, so VEGM, if you only have VEGM, so you, you, you can see my, uh, my, uh, my mouse, right? Correct, we can see. As yeah. So if we have single chamber electrograms, we can use local VEGM morphology. We can look at the VV stability at the onset, if it's sudden or not, response to ATP or shock. And sometimes you can see this is less well known. You can see atrial uh, far field signal on the ventricular channel, and that will tell you something about A and V relationship. If we have dual EGMs, dual chamber electrograms, then you have the same thing, plus you can judge the mechanism of onset. You can see if it was a PAC or PVC, and you can judge the AV dissociation or association. So this table shows this AEGM expo exposed. How did we do the study? We took, dual, uh, we took 100 device electrograms that were complex, and we, uh, so there were 50 uh, SVT and 50 VT electrograms. And we hid, we covered the atrial channel initially, and we gave it to EP specialists, uh, seasoned attendings, we gave it to fellows, and we gave it to EP nurses. And then we uh, had them interpret and say what it was and what criteria they used. And after that, we uncovered the atrial channel and uh, uh, gave them same electrograms in a different order and had them reinterpret. And then we, so the, the results were, so this is an example. So this is a dual chamber device. We have the HL channel covered, and you just have ventricular, ventricular electrograms, far field. Uh, actually, this is bipolar, so this is local EGM. And uh, then we have markers. And uh, so let's see if we can sort of interpret that. So um, does the morphology change? Morphology looks similar. Is the onset sudden? It is sudden. Um, is it very fast? No. Um, is the V, no, v to V is stable? No, it's actually unstable, right? It's a variable V to V. So uh, do we see atrial uh, signal on the V channel? Mm, I don't think so. So any, any suggestions what this may be? Is it SVT or VT? Uh, it will probably take some time to unmute uh, people, right? So, um, well, anyways, let me make it simple because this is a teaching case. Um, so um, this was actually VT, even though the, this is an example that the electrogram morphology can be very, very similar. If you look at the HL channel on top, you see that there is an AV dissociation. All right, so it, it's illustrating that HL electrogram is actually very helpful. Um, well, here's another example. This is more complex. Uh, again, HL channel is covered on top, and then at the bottom, I already uncovered that. You see that morphology changes, but despite the fact that the morphology changes and the device thinks that this is VF, see this VF? Um, and I'll enlarge it a little bit and we'll go over why the device thinks this is VF. So uh, morphology change, device is thinking this is VF, but when you look at the HL channel, there is one-to-one -one AV association. So this was actually SVT illustrating that, um, and it starts with a PAC, not with a PVC. Uh, let me enlarge it so it's a little easier to see. So this is the same electrogram, just larger. So we can see that 
when it starts, it starts with a PAC. Um, and uh, the reason for this double counting is actually also interesting. This is something that we'll go over a little bit later. Why is the device double counting here? It's T wave over sensing. See, it's seeing the T waves. Always look, if there is one thing that mm, you will bring back from this lecture is uh, always look at the markers. Always look at what the device is thinking. So looking at the markers, this marker corresponds to the T wave. This marker corresponds to the QRS. So device is double counting. All right, so device thought this was VF, but this is actually SVT as um, I have demonstrated to you by using those additional criteria from uh, uh, dual chamber electrodes. And um, this is the end of this episode, how it, it actually device shocked it. There is a high voltage shock. It terminated it, of course, it would terminate SVT as well. But uh, this is the end of this episode. Uh, this is from the same uh, study. We looked how much uh, presence of HL electrograms actually helped. And um, you can see that as far as diagnostic accuracy for VT, AP attendings did the best with single chamber electrograms. They did significantly better than fellows and uh, uh, EP nurses. So gray hair does matter. And all groups improved when we gave them the information on dual chamber electrograms. This is as far as VT diagnosis. With SVT, uh, all groups were similar and they improved, or they all improved when they were given additional dual uh, HL uh, channel information. So um, here's another example. This is not from the study, this is something else. And uh, maybe this can be interactive, Nishan, uh, if we can. Uh, so this is, uh, oh, I already gave the answer. Um, this is a single chamber, actually dual, ch sorry, here's my marker. So uh, you have HL channel on top, uh, ventricular sense, so this is bipolar next to it, and then there are markers, A sense, V sense, and then there are numbers at the bottom that help you to differentiate. So on the first glance, it looks like one-to-one -one tachycardia. Anybody ventures to tell me what it might be looking at some other numbers that are given on the screen? Any thoughts? Look at the irregularity. Look at what is driving what. Who is driving whom? Atrium is driving the ventricle or ventricle is driving the atrium? You all right. are able to unmute and um, talk. You're not unable. All right. So, well, let's see. Uh, I'll... They, Michael, they are able to. Oh, they're able to. Okay. All right. So, um, the ventricle is driving. The ventricle is driving the atrium. Exactly. So, here is one example, right? Longer V to V and then longer A to A. Here, another one, longer V to V. So, you suspect that this is VT, correct? All right, let's see if I, um... okay, so this is the same patient's continuation of the same episode. Look here, very clearly, and at the bottom, you have VA dissociation, so it was VT. So one-to-one -one AV relationship does not necessarily mean SVT. Always look at who is driving home, right? And then, so that's continuation of this episode. It took actually several, several rounds of ATP, so ATP number one, ATP number two, and then finally it breaks it. All right, another VTSVT case, actually cases, several cases. So this is an episode, device thinks it's VTVF. I actually don't remember what it was, let's see. So again, looking from the top, on the top there is atrial channel and you can immediately tell that this is atrial fibrillation right very fast a lot of atrial activity at the bottom you have a regular ventricular signal corresponding to atrial fibrillation this is ventricular bipolar signal and then you have markers there is intermittent uh, under sensing of atrial fibrillation as expected and then there are predominantly v-sensed signal uh, at the bottom um, this is a St. Jude recording. So you have this morphology markers. Uh, the asterisk means that this is 100% morphology match. Uh, T 
it's a tachycardia. So it's very important to know, at least have some idea about most, uh, most common markers and designations on, on those. So uh, they change all the time. So I'm trying to keep myself uh, up to date as far as those markers and um, designations, very important. All right, let's see what happens next. So this is a little small, but uh, you can see that all of a sudden, ventricular rate accelerates, it's very, very fast. Cycle length about 250. Is it actually compatible with rapid atrial fibrillation or is it incompatible with life so fast it is? And then it goes even faster and then organizes itself very regular, slightly different electrogram. And then uh, eventually it actually breaks, right? It breaks, but then the device delivers a shock. So any idea what that was? Any, any takers on this one? So let's go over this together. So atrial, we, we know patient is in atrial fibrillation. Then it's all of a sudden it accelerates to a faster rate. The rate is so fast, I cannot be, this is again, this uh, electrograms come from a lot of places you don't always know the clinical scenario but this is so fast that most likely this is ventricular fibrillation and then it organizes a little bit here electrogram looks different so probably ventricular flutter and then it breaks it breaks and here it's interrupted right why does the device shock here you have three beats that are faster the device was already reconfirming getting ready for a shock you got three more beats boom, it shocks in actually not for a good reason. It was um, during the reconfirmation that it delivered a shock. So, but the teaching point here, interesting point here, is that atrial fibrillation can sometimes set a uh, nidus for ventricular fibrillation. We've seen it uh, in some old device trials that patients who were in atrial fibrillation would more frequently go into VF. So here goes into VF and then uh, device shocks and uh, shock actually restores sinus rhythm. AFib was terminated, even though the shock was delivered after VF or flutter stopped. All right, so here is another one. It also calls it for VTVF episode. Let's see if that's true. Um, so you have atrial channel on the top, ventricular bipolar again next to it, and then markers. What is the device thinking? What is the device doing? So first of all, rhythm is sinus here, right? And then at the bottom, you have sinus with PVCs, a uh, couple of beats, and then very fast rhythm starts, and then probably slows down a little bit and then continues, and then you have a shock. And uh, what happens? with the atrial rhythm, atrial rhythm actually accelerates here. So uh, this is a shock for um, ventricular arrhythmia, ventricular fibrillation or ventricular, very fast ventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachyarrhythmia. Um, let's see what happens next. So then it actually restarts again. And uh, here's another shock. It terminates it, what happens next? Another PVC, it restarts. And then continues, 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 another shock, and finally sinus rhythm is restored. So this is an example of kind of relentless VT requiring multiple shocks, VTVF, I would say. All right, um, another VTSVT case. Um, so the device calls it high ventricular rate episode. And we can look at the designation of the device. This is actually a pacemaker. So this will not be an ICD, this is a pacemaker. Let's look at the electrograms. This is position one HL sense signal. Second is leadless ECG. So this is the far field signal that you would like to see. It helps you, it helps you to differentiate better between um, VT and SVT. It gives you some semblance to um, one of the surface leads. 
and there is the local bipolar signal, and then the markers. Let's go over the markers a little bit because this is important. So a sense, a pace is obvious. What is SIR? SIR is sensor indicated rate. What does it mean? It means that the patient is probably exercising and the sensor is telling the device what to do, what, at what rate to pace. And that's why here, a sense, a sense, and then the HL pace appears. So the device thinks that patient is exercising needs more heart rate, sensor indicated rate. What is VIP? ventricular intrinsic preference. So this is the feature that promotes intrinsic conduction. So uh, it was working here, but then when a pace takes over, it continues to do that. So VIP is present and SIR is present. Um, let's go back for a second. So here you have a, a PVC, a bunch of PVCs, and then um, this is continuation of the same episode, and then something interesting happens here. You have um, continuation of a pa HL pacing. Then there is a ventricular paced event. After the ventricular paced event, uh, probably the intrinsic, the sinus, sinus A falls in the refractory. That's why it's blacked out. It's called AR, HM in the refractory. That A in the refractory is actually ignored for timing purposes, and we'll go over this in more detail a little bit later. And that's why the device paces in the atrium. So this is an example of competitive HL pacing. And it does it again after the second pace beat. And then um, something interesting happens. So after this HL paced, event, you have another V-paced event, probably sinus, and then an arrhythmia starts, right? And how does it start? Starts with a PVC or with a PAC? So there is a, this, this is HL pacing, right? So this is A-paced. And then there is uh, another V-paced event and another A. So is it possible that this HL paced event, HL pacing stimulus caused this HL arrhythmia, HL tachycardia, rapid HL beat, rapid HL rhythm. And then as a consequence of that, rapid ventricular response. So this is one-to-one -one tachycardia where we need to decide whether it's ventricular tachycardia or SVT. Morphology, if we compare it to sinus rhythm, morphology looks kind of similar, maybe a little different. It's definitely different from ventricular pacing, right? So ventricular pacing is drastically different. Arrhythmia probably starts uh, with this. So this is atrial event that is superimposed on ventricular paced event. So it is likely that this HL pacing uh, sp stimulus triggered atrial tachycardia, going fast, conducting one-to-one, -one, and resulting in this rapid, rapid rhythm. So my interpretation of this is that this is actually atrial, uh, atrial tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia, conducting one-to-one. -one. It's very regular, so we cannot, it's very hard to tell what is driving what is driving what, uh, but the sequence is such that this atrial, it starts with a PAC basically, and uh, uh, not with a PVC. Uh, any questions, any comments about this, about this electrogram? Let's move on. Um, Another SVTVT case. I think you're already getting tired from this. Maybe we'll skip that. I want to skip that. All right, let's go to this. Um, um, this is a multiple choice question. So this is to conclude this section on SVT versus VT. So this is a single chamber pacemaker program VVI. Uh, it uh, 70 beats per minute with hysteresis on. So the question starts CPR, defibrillate, place an ICD, program hysteresis off, all of the above. 
Oh, and already, unfortunately, the answer is below. So, well, you're right. I mean, the answer is already revealed below. So it's all of the above. Well, what, what happened here? So, um, you have a single chamber device. Uh, hysteresis is on. Hysteresis is a function that allows the device to actually not pace to uh, come in when the rate slows down. So there is, because of that, there is a pause. Uh, there is a pause between the sinus, or it's probably HL fibrillation between intrinsic beat and the next V paced event. And then that causes a PVC and triggers uh, ventricular fibrillation. So do we need to start CPR? Probably, defibrillate? Probably, place an ICD? Probably, but most importantly, program hysteresis to off. So that's this, this question. All right. Uh, let's see, can I get this? Okay. So the next section I wanted to spend some time on looking at different forms of atrial tachycardia and atrial fibrillation. And just to illustrate this, um, when you look at multiple device electrograms, you can see that atrial fibrillation can look like this. This is very coarse, very rugged, very irregular, very chaotic, multi-form, multifocal uh, kind of uh, rugged atrial fibrillation. It can also look like this, be more organized. Um, and um, Maybe we can look at another feature here again. We'll talk about this a little bit later. What is happening here? Why is this, again, in the black ARAP, HL in the refractory and then HL paste event? What is that? What does it mean? Why is it pacing? Why is the device pacing the atrium when there was an intrinsic HL event? Because Any, the intrinsic atrial event was in PVARP? Yes, it was in the PVARP. So why is it pacing? Why is it pacing? Because it's ignored for timing purposes, right? Yes. So what is this? Uh, what is this? Um, this is an example of what kind of pacing? It's a competition, right? It's competitive atrial pacing. So it's competing, it's, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this later. So this is an example when this was ignored and then an A-paste. And what happened possibly? What could have happened because of this A-paste event? You went into AFib or atrial tachycardia? Poss possibly, yes, exactly. So it could have been a trigger for that. So, um, but this is, uh, I'm primarily showing it here because of the more organized nature of this ATAF. It can also look, like this. So this is another example. So this is very organized. Here you may want to say this is probably HL flutter or more organized uh, HL fibrillation. All right. So um, um, let's see. Here is uh, something that frequently happens during HL fibrillation. And you can see that the electrograms are pretty crisp here. And the device is recognizing pretty much all of them. But what is happening at the top? Did arrhythmia start here and finish here? Or was AFib going all along and then continued here? You kind of get a sense that AFib is still going on here, even though the device is A-pacing. So this is an example of just under sensing during atrial fibrillation, and that's why the device doesn't see it, doesn't recognize it, and, and, and a paces. And this is very common because the amplitude is low, and uh, uh, the lead may be in such a location that during atrial fibrillation it records very low amplitude signals and will under sense. However, um, when you see something like this, uh, oops, I'm going to go back. It's also important to think about noise, right? And that's why uh, the next question is, is it noise or a real thing? Let's look at some examples of that. 
Very important to look at the device markers, as I already uh, mentioned earlier. So this is a different manufacturer. This is Biotronic, not a very high quality electrogram. I apologize, it was sent to me from somewhere. But let's look at the markers. So the markers, um, there are more markers. This is single, uh, this is single uh, channel, so this is it's a far field, so this is basically your leadless ECG, and this is ventricular local signal. And uh, these look like QRSs, right? But then between QRSs, there is something, and there is more markers indicating that the device is actually seeing that. So, and down at the bottom, you have even more. Um, is this real thing or is it noise? What do you think? Well, this is an example of noise, uh, and uh, let's see what happens next. So here, noise actually gets more frequent. There is some kind of a, so this is QRS and this is QRS, and then between them, um, uh, there are those signals, um, and the device is seeing them, and then something happens here, uh, and then, very, very fast and different arrhythmia appears. Let me enlarge it for you. So this is this event that actually triggered that. And you can see that the device declared ventricular fibrillation there. And then even though I don't know what happened, this was sent to me from somewhere, I see the 73 ohms. So it must have delivered a shock. So the device was seeing noise. Uh, noise eventually triggered a shock. And shock uh, by RNT phenomenon triggered ventricular fibrillation. So this is an example of false detection of VF because of noise triggering real VF. And then this is after the shock. So the shock was actually after multiple shocks. You see a lot of noise. So what happened here? Why is it so much noise after the shock? It is possible that multiple shocks have actually fried the lead. So the lead disintegrated even further. The conductor is not as good, uh, even worse than it was in the beginning. And then you see a lot of electrical noise. And when we look at the counters, you see that device thought that it had seven unsuccessful shocks. So the device was delivering shock after shock uh, because it was seeing more and more noise. And then I looked at the Pacing parameters, amazingly, pacing impedance is pretty normal. High voltage impedance is also pretty normal. R wave is okay. So that brings another subject. How do the leads actually fail? You see a lot of examples. So there are possibly three different ways. Uh, you see patients with um, uh, high impedance or low impedance, right? You see uh, patients with noise on the leads, or you can see a combination of those. And in um, some observations, it looks like the noise may be actually preceding the development of uh, impedance changes. And in this particular case, you see that. So impedance is normal, but patient had noise. So that's uh, um, uh, indicating that the lead is disintegrating. All right, so here is another example of noise. And here maybe somebody from the audience can help me with that a little bit. So this is HL channel up on top then ventricular sense channel, and then markers. So what kind of noise are we seeing here? And is it noise, first of all? No volunteers? EMI? What's that? EMI? Yes, that's probably, and why do we think about that? Because you see it on both channels, right? So it's, uh, uh, if you saw it on one lead, you're more likely to have something wrong with the lead. If it's on both leads, then the chances that both leads failed simultaneously uh, is probably less. So that's correct. Okay. Um, here is another example of, um, sort of noise or false detection. And let's see if we can figure it out together. So this is dual chamber electrogram. Again, HM on top, ventricular next to it, markers, and then whatever the device is thinking. So the device is thinking here, ventricular sense. And then there is another marker 
down below and the morphology, there is no, X means no morphology match and definitely no morphology match here. And then here there's a morphology match and then another, another marker. And that marker corresponds to the T wave, right? So what is, what is that an example of? This is T wave over sensing. So that, that's another thing that can be, uh, can result in, in appropriate therapies from the device. And this is the same thing enlarged, so you can see it more clear. All right. Um, oh God. All right, so let's, uh, this is a multiple choice question again. Um, so what are we seeing on, on, on this, um, on this 12 lead electrocardiogram? Um, Ventricular capture, pseudo pseudo fusion, safety pacing, all of the above. Well, you saw my answer, unfortunately, there, I think. But um, all right, we're going to wait for the poll. Well, the true answer is all of the above, and let's see if we can find them. So, ventricular capture, example of ventricular capture. I'll just close that. So example of ventricular capture is this. So ventricular capture is present. What is pseudo pseudofusion? This is more, more esoteric. Anybody remembers? Well, pseudo pseudofusion is when HL pacing actually falls on the QRS and looks like a pseudofusion, but it's not ventricular signal, which we typically um, call pseudofusion. It's HL pacing. So this is an example right, right there, one, two, three, four, five, six beat. First spike is not the ventricular spike, it's actually the HL spike, right? Because it's followed by the other little spike. So this is an example of pseudo pseudofusion when HL pacing uh, spike falls on the beginning of the QRS looks like pseudofusion, but it's not because it's on the, in the HM. Safety pacing, that's pretty simple here. That's this short, short timing between two spikes. This is safety pacing. Example of HL under sensing. Well, this is an example of HL under sensing because there is a P wave and it still paced the HM, right? And HL failure to capture, right there. So that's, that's an example. All right, um, all of the above. Um, this is an interesting topic that I already alluded to, and then you don't get a lot of teaching on this uh, during your AP fellowship. It kind of looks esoteric, but it turns out by the analysis of large volumes of electrogram data that this is very, very common. And I will tell you a little later how common it may be. Um, so what is competitive HL pacing and particularly, very particular, very specific form of it called repetitive non-reentrant ventricular HL synchrony. Um, you can probably look at that uh, because the slides will be saved later on. So I'm not gonna go in a lot of detail. So you can just go why this occurs. Um, but basically it's a sequence when um, after ventricular pacing, a retrograde conduction falls in the refractory. It's not used for timing purposes. Uh, therefore the device will pace the atrium if it's told to do so by, for example, by, uh, by the sensor, if there is a sensor indicated rate, because the atrium was already excited retrogradely, so atrium is refractory, HL pace will not capture. HL pace event will, indu uh, will trigger uh, AV interval. This will be followed by ventricular pace event, and again, will result in retrograde conduction, and the same sequence will continue, and this will cause something very similar to endless loop tachycardia, but it's somewhat different from uh, PMT. Um, and on the, uh, this is an example of how it may look on the, on the 12 lead. And this is, this may be proarrhythmic as we've already seen, and uh, so this may induce atrial fibrillation. So uh, this is an example of that uh, clinical example. And uh, in this particular case, this old algorithm was present. This was since uh, 
debunked. It's not used anymore. It's AFX, it's HL overdrive facing uh, that was believed to suppress HL fibrillation. In reality, it was actually triggering HL fibrillation by promoting competitive HL pacing. So here we have V-pace, V-pace, and then after V-pace to event, there is retrograde conduction in the refractory, and then uh, HL pacing because of that, and uh, then it triggers HL fibrillation. Um, actually, I'm sorry, this is not triggering atrial fibrillation. Uh, this, is, this is just triggering the sequence of um, atrium in the refractory and A pacing, and uh, the device thinks that it triggered, uh, that uh, atrial fibrillation is present, because um, the device will count this, all these events, and will think that there are too many atrial events in the atrium. So this is just uh, ongoing AFX with uh, retrograde conduction and uh, with uh, HL pacing. So this is an example of this um, repetitive non-reentrant ventricular HL synchrony. Um, and as I said, the, this will cause an appropriate mode switch because the device will count all these events in the atrium and we'll think that there are two HL events for uh, one ventricular event, and uh, that will result in mode switch, as you see here. AMS stands for mode switch, and uh, so the device mode switched for, actually not for a real thing, because this was not AFib. It was just um, competitive HL pacing. Uh, and here's an example of why RNRVAS and PMT are two sides of the same problem. What happens here, uh, the rate changes a little bit and the refractory periods change. And when the refractory period gets a little shorter, it gets 254 from 269, retrograde conduction become, comes out from underneath of the PVARP and then it is sensed and then it triggers PMT. So slight change, and this all happens because of the sensor indicated rate, slightly, uh, slightly faster, patient is probably exercising, so conduction changes, refractory periods change a little bit. And uh, when um, uh, it's, it becomes a little faster, then um, PVARP actually shortened because of the exercise. And then the HL sensed event becomes uh, comes out of from underneath the refractory, and uh, then P, uh, RNRVS becomes actually pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So these two things may occur almost simultaneously and represent two sides of the same problem. Just in one instance, um, HL retrograde conduction occurs within the PVARP, and uh, with PMT, it's outside of the PVARP. Therefore, if you think about it, uh, curing PMT by lengthening, lengthening the PVARP may not necessarily solve the problem because you may convert PMT into RNRVS uh, in future instances. All right, RNRVS consequences. I've already mentioned that it could be proarrhythmic and you've seen examples of that. So here's an example of competitive HL pacing and the type of this pacing is RNRVS. You see the typical sequence. V pace, A sense in the refractory, A pace. And this is again sensor indicated rate, so a patient is exercising. And then um, uh, when the timing is right, the appropriately or inappropriately delivered HL pacing stimulus in the refractory, probably similar to um, RNT phenomenon, triggers HL fibrillation. Let's see what happens next. So this is the same event enlarged. You can actually see that uh, there's a slight prolongation in, the, um, in this timing. And so slight lengthening of the period between the retrograde conduction and delivered a paced event. And that became proarrhythmic enough to trigger this HL fibrillation. Let's see what happens next. Um, so um, rhythm accelerates, becomes faster. Device is thinking that this is ventricular tachycardia. So you see here tachysense and uh, then it delivers ATP. 
doesn't do anything, delivers another ATP. And uh, slowly, so it slows down and uh, then device thinks that it's done. So this is an example of inappropriate triggering of atrial fibrillation by competitive atrial pacing and then subsequent uh, mistaken recognition of ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation and the tachycardia pacing. So this is, this is not a benign phenomenon. It could be, it could be, uh, it could be very proarrhythmic and could result in dangerous consequences. All right, so this is a uh, sort of summary of how to prevent or fix competitive HL pacing. Again, I'll leave it, you can look at that later, but not to go into all the detail. But so PVC algorithms uh, can be used. And uh, basically the thing is to try to avoid faster, uh, so the pacing at faster rates. So, and uh, whatever uh, intervals are there, to adapt them to faster rates. So if there is a rate adaptive AV delay, turn it on. Um, if there is a uh, rate adaptive PVARP, turn that on and use those other algorithms. Uh, there are no specific algorithms for um, RNRVS termination and there are algorithms for PMT termination. So um, that also you have to keep in mind. So uh, PMT is probably easier to deal with than RNRVS. Okay, so here are some examples of combination of things. So you can have oversensing and competitive pacing. So this is an example of both. And it's a, uh, again, let's look at the markers. Initially, this starts. So first of all, the device thinks that this is ATF detection. This is, uh, if we can turn, um, I, will, uh, I would like to hear what the audience thinks about this one. This is sort of interesting. Uh, so it starts as a sinus, then again, sinus uh, sensor indicated rate. And then you have this interesting combination of markers. So you have V-pace, V-pace, but in, in between them, there are three markers. There is one A-sense, another A-sense, and then A-pace. Why are there three markers? What is the device thinking? What is it seeing? So this one is obvious, right? This is retrograde conduction. So there is a big HL spike. What is, this, what is this marker corresponding to? It corresponds to this little blip there. What is that? Any takers? All right. uh, it's a very rounded signal. So it's just in a, almost at the same time that ventricular pacing occurs. So this is probably a far field signal there. So this is far field over sensing followed by retrograde conduction and then followed by in a pro competitive HL pacing. So this can be seen as well. So obviously the device will mode switch for this because it's seeing three events in the atrium. All right. Um, here's another example of some over sensing. So it starts as HL sensing and by V pacing. And then again, because of the sensor indicated rate, so probably patient is exercising, A pacing starts. A pacing and then this little signal again. What is that? Nobody wants to. Over. Yeah, so it's a far field. It's a far field signal again. All right, let's see. And that, can, that's... I, can I ask something here? Sure. Why isn't the far field detected in the first part of the... Well, it, it's a good question. The timing changed. See, the timing slightly changed because uh, A pacing starts. So, and uh, just literally probably a millisecond of something of conduction changed and then it, it just, it's, it's detected. The timing changed. So, and then a pacing, and here is the same thing, right? So it's a far, so with a pacing, you have, uh, uh, it, it is also possible that the amplitudes changed a little bit, right? So because a pacing versus a sense. So, and this is an example of an appropriate detection, again, device mode switches for that. 
uh, inappropriate mode switching because of the far field signal. And uh, HL pacing for the same reason, right? Okay, so here is an example. Uh, this is another multiple choice. This is fairly straightforward. Um, um, so this is a um, dual chamber device. And uh, Um, the device is doing something on the HL channel. You see the markers, then ventricular markers, and then here are the electrograms. So what do we do? We reprogram upper rate limit. We replace the ventricular lead, replace HL lead, lengthen PVARP, or lengthen AV delay. All right, and everybody got it right. So reprogram upper rate limit because this represents obviously the upper rate behavior. So that's a Venkibach at the upper rate. Good, excellent, 100%. All right, um, get rid of that. All right, so that's with the knowledge of this, uh, we can probably get this couple continue their relationship. I don't remember if I have any more slides after this. Yes, so that was it. So that was the conclusion of um, this talk.